What up, y'all? This is your boy, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report for Monday, September 15, 2014, delivering some of the major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash the Entertainment Report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, or on Twitter at the Enter Report. Hopefully, everybody had a great weekend. Rapper Kanye West ranted on stage Monday about everyone from Ben Affleck to Matt Lauer, but never issued an apology as he fired back at criticism over singing out a wheelchair-using fan at a concert in Australia. West said during a show in Sydney, pick a new target, pick a new target, because I'm not one of those dumbass artists that you're used to. Come, You come at me, I'm going to take my platform and break this shit down for real, intelligent people every night, and then we'll get back to the music. The Stronger is Rapper's comments follows a backlash he faced after stopping a Friday show at the Quantas Credit Union Arena in Sydney because two fans weren't standing. West told the crowd to stand for the next sun, song unless you got a handicap pass where you can get special parking and shit. As it turns out, West's target was in a wheelchair. But anyone looking for a contrition at Monday's show when, would be disappointed. West instead lashed out at the media. He said, since this is such big media press news and everything that obviously they tried to uh, demonize me, it's like, well, welcome to today's news, ladies and gentlemen. We've got Americans getting killed on TV, kids getting killed every weekend in Chicago, unarmed people getting killed by police officers. I'm not going to make one of them Ben Affleck statements and shit. So, people on the Today Show, I'm not sure I keep up with the news, but if my, Michael Strahan is still at the Today Show, no. Good morning, America, Matt Lauer, the girls on The View, Whoopi Goldberg, Robin Roberts. If y'all run this, take a step back and look at this. I'm a married Christian man with a family, he added. At my concerts, I make sure everybody has a good as time as possible. So all this demonizing me ain't going to work after a while. Singer Robin Thicke admitted that he was high on multiple substances during the creation of the smash hit Blurred Lines with T.I. and Pharrell. The singer made the admission during an April deposition taken as part of a lawsuit over the song. Asked whether he was in the studio with Blurred Lines co-writer Pharrell Williams when the rhythm track of the song was created, Thicke replied, To be honest, that's the only part where I was high on Vicodin and alcohol when I showed up at the studio. Relatives of the deceased singer Marvin Gaye filed suit against Thick last year, claiming that Blurred Nines ripped off Gaye's 1977 classic, Got to Give It Up. The Gaye's lawsuit cites interviews that Thick did with GQ and Billboard as evidence as he lifted the sound of Gaye's song for his own. In a GQ interview, Thick is quoted as saying, Pharrell and I were in the studio and I told him that one of my favorite songs of all time was Marvin Gaye's Got to Give It Up. I was like, damn, we... To make something like that, something with that groove. However, during the deposition, Thick claimed that he had lied during the interview because he was jealous of Williams, who Thick claims wrote the lion's share of blurred lines. He said, after making an album that I wrote and produced myself, the biggest hit of my career was written and produced by somebody else, and I was jealous and I wanted I wanted some of the credit, Thick said in the deposition. Adam Lambert will return to the house that built him when he steps in for Keith Urban as the judge for the American Idol New York auditions. Urban is currently with his wife, Nicole Kim, and grieving the loss of her father last week. The show broke the news via its Twitter account, writing, Adam Lambert will be serving as a guest judge at the New York audition. Our thoughts are with Keith and his family during this difficult time. Lambert took second place during season eight. He came back during season 13 as a guest mentor alongside Chris Doherty from season five. Both men represent artists who failed to win American Idol and still went on to great success in the entertainment industry. Daughtry came in fourth during his season. Auditions will be held at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn on Wednesday. Season 14 of American Idol returns to Fox in early 2015. After banking some pretty terrible television ratings, the Miss America pageant still inspired a lot of social chatter. The pageant topped the Nielsen Twitter TV ratings this week. At 9 p.m. on Sunday, the pageant received a 1.5 out of 4, and the advertisers covered an 18 to 49 demographic, down 25% from last year, and 6.7 million viewers, according to traditional Nielsen ratings. That means it dipped one tenth of a ratings point to its lower lowest demo number in the four years that it had been on broadcast TV. In contrast, the pageant netted 304,000. Um, uh, events related tweets that were seen by a unique audience of 4.3 million people. 
that was more than last week's um, presidential address and Tuesday's premiere of X FX's Sons of Anarchy. Comedian Bill Maher provided laughs and big numbers for HBO. The special Bill Maher Live from D.C. drew 1.1 million viewers with its premiere, which aired at 10 p.m. on Friday. That was enough to make it the most watched comedy special premiere since December 2006-2009 when Ron Williams' Weapons of Self-Destruction racked up 1.9 million total viewers. Between its initial airing and the second play live from D.C. totaled 1.6 million total viewers. The special, which was directed and produced by Troy Miller via his Dakota Pictures production company, was preceded by the return of Real Time with Bill Maher at 9, which pulled in 1.1 million viewers, with its initial airing 1.8 million across two airings, marking a 22% boost over the show's last airing on August 1st. Barbara Streisand is one of the most revered entertainers of the modern era, so it perhaps made sense that she complete completely took over The Tonight Show on Monday during her first guest appearance in Late Night in more than 50 years, even if it wasn't her idea. Streisand herself admitted that she doesn't remember all of the shows she's been on and took delight in a picture Jimmy Fallon produced of her on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show when she was a teen. Um, he said uh, she had to look at it from behind the desk, though, because Fallon insisted she sits there. He said this is the first time in over 50 years you're here, I think you should sit behind the desk. Let's be honest, you'll never come back here. And she stayed there throughout the show, except during her two performances. She kicked off her night with the melody of some of the duets that she's performed on her new album, Partners, available Tuesday. But as Elvis Presley, Blake Shelton, and Michael Bublé weren't on hand for their parts, Fallon ably stepped in. He admitted the EGOT winner, a nickname for the exclusive group of only 12 people who have won an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and a Tony Award, that he was actually worried about her coming onto the show. Um, according to Fallon, if there was one person on the planet who earned the right to be a diva, it was Barbara Streisand. He said he told her candidly, marveling at how charming and down to earth she was, I was afraid that you were going to be more of a nightmare. She said that she's, quote, quite ordinary and that she and her husband, James Brown, live a simple life. She says, we don't really like the big time stardom things, so we stay home most of the time. Streisand also also wrote, that's why I'm going to write a book, because I swear to God these myths are so far-fetched. She opened and closed her appearance on the show with songs saying farewell with the solo version of Come Rain or Come Shine from her album. The 72-year-old legend was on her game vocally and more than game for dealing with Fallon's giddy schoolboy uh, school shtick. She asked him after the duet, do you really want to be a singer? I wouldn't give up my night job. She quickly clarified that she was teasing him and that she was actually impressed with his musical abilities. She and her husband are apparently avid viewers of Fallon's Tonight Show, so at least there was a mutual adoration party. Emotions ran high as Beyonce and Jay-Z ended their on-the-run stadium tour Saturday night in Paris, a city where a lot of personal meaning uh, has for the couple. Jay-Z told the audience, we love Paris. It's special, it's special to us because we got engaged here, and this is where Baby Blue was conceived. Couple married in 2008, and their daughter Blue Ivy is now two. On stage, the superstar performers also praised one another. A teary eyed Beyonce, 33, told her husband, who's 44, I'm your biggest fan and I love you. Jay Z responded, The greatest entertainer in the world, I love her, she's my wife. The tour's final concert mirrored last month's MTV Music Video Music Awards when a teary Beyonce was joined on stage by Jay Z and Blue Ivy, and numerous rumors surrounded their marriage. One recent rumor is that the couple is expecting their second child. May have been put to rest Saturday when Jay-Z and Beyonce were spotted drinking champagne backstage after the show. The couple released a short film earlier today for fans who can't wait uh, for the footage from the Paris concert when it airs in on the HBO special September 20th. Uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z Bang Bang Part 1 is a part of a trilogy of short films that appeared throughout their two and a half month long tour. Short in black and white and set in the Neo uh, Morchione's 1965 soundtrack for the Clint Eastwood Western for a few dollars more. Jay-Z and Beyonce are a modern-day Bonnie and Clyde, as Jay put it, on the run from everything, on the run from becoming a cliché, on the run from doing the same thing again. Controversy has hit the Netflix series Orange is the New Black. Writer Lauren Morelli has broken up with her husband and since been... Uh, and since begun dating Samir Wiley, the actress who plays Posey on the show. According to Morelli, it was writing 
scenes for Piper and Alex that gave her clarity on her own sexuality. She wrote in an essay for Mick, I found a mouthpiece for my own desire and a glimmer of what my future could look like. And she also wrote, I realized I was gay in fall of 2012, one of my first days on the set. It wasn't so much one thing, but the sum of many small details, how uncomfortable I felt around a group of lesbians, or how I consider myself uh, a, quote, non-very sexual person. When considered alone, these seemed like little quirks that made me me. Wanting to read a book instead of having sex is a perfectly reasonable preference to have, right? But on set, these small moments came into sharp relief, and I found myself answering to an endless stream of cast members who, pre who peppered me with questions like a gaggle for, of kindergartners curious about their new teacher. Are you dating anyone? You're married to a man, but you're used to kiss girls. Do you miss it? I was finally forced to consider a question that had never, ever occurred to me before. Holy shit, am I gay? Timsey went on to report that the divorce has gone amicably following the couple's two years of marriage, with Morelli keeping her Lexus and her ex-husband getting the Mazda hatchback, etc. Yet, as interesting as dividing up luxury vehicles and non-luxury vehicles may be the obvious point of the story, is that Morelli is now in a relationship with Posey, and our hearts are just swelling with love right now, and hey, they look so good together in this Instagram photo that's on the internet. The Django Unchained actress who claimed she was harassed and hurt by cops after making out when her boyfriend was actually having sex in her car, according to witnesses, then went on a rant with cops, accusing them of racism and not knowing who she was, according to police audio obtained by TMZ. Danielle Watts had just left CBS Studios in the San Fernando Valley around 2 p.m. Thursday. She says she was making out with her boyfriend, but TMZ has learned witnesses from the nearby art director's guild office building told cops they were watching her and her boyfriend having full-on sex in the passenger seat with the doors open. The witnesses said the guy was sitting in the seat, she was straddling him, and it was for everyone to see. What witness told cops they cleaned themselves up afterwards with the tissue. TMZ obtained police audio of the incident. Watts instantly played the, car, the race card when Sergeant Jim Parker asked for her ID. She quickly moved from the race card to the fame card, then stormed off, refusing to show her ID. While Watts was gone, Sergeant Parker had a very cordial conversation with her boyfriend, Brian. She was apprehended by another cop in a short distance away and brought back, and things got nuclear. Some of her cho choice words, I think I'd like to identify you to my publicist. I serve freedom and love. You guys deserve detainment. That's cool. I hope when you're fucking your spouses, you really feel alive. TMZ told she plans to file a complaint with the LAPD and has hired a lawyer. Minnesota Vikings... Uh, star Adrian Peterson is under investigation for a second child abuse case involving one of his other children. This new investigation involves an incident that allegedly went down in June 2013, and the probe was launched after the, then the four-year-old boy went home to his mother with a scar on his forehead. The station says Adrian sent the mother a text message saying that the child hit his head on a car seat, but when the mother questioned him further, Peterson eventually admitted hitting the child. The mother reported the incident to Child Protective Services, but no charges were ever filed against Peterson. Now, sources close to the investigation told TMC the reason the case went nowhere is because Adrian did not strike the boy in the forehead, but instead the child accidentally hit his head on the car seat while Adrian was punishing him. TMC also told the form of discipline was not impermissible. Under Texas law, parents are allowed to administer reasonable punishment. Peterson's attorney told TMC as an adult witness backed him up, saying Adrian, quote, did nothing appropriate with his son. The woman under investigation for allegedly stalking Chris Jenner is telling the FBI to bring it on because her, quote, friend is the one who hacked Chris's phone. Christina Bankston had her room at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills raided by the feds last week, but claims nothing on any of her electronics they confiscated could possibly implicate her. Now she's throwing a friend named Troy under the bus, claiming he used her computer to hack Chris's email, Twitter and iCloud accounts over the course of several months. Um, TMZ posted video of Christina on a Disneyland roller coaster a few days before the raid where she repeatedly screams, I love you, Chris. She sounds kind of obsessed, but Christina says it was just her being, quote, crazy. Iggy Azalea's lawyers are throwing the kitchen sink at a major porn company now claiming Vivid will get its dirty corporate ass suit if it dares to market her alleged sex tape because the name Iggy can only be used by Iggy. It seems the sex tape exists, even though her lawyers deny it. 
Initially, they said it was a fabrication. Then it said if it does exist, she may have been a minor. The sex partner, Webbersby rapper Hefe Wine, told TMZ Live Friday that there is indeed a tape, and she knew all about it and consented, and she says she was not a minor. She, uh, and As a matter of fact, he says he met her when she was 18. Now, Iggy's lawyers have fired off a letter to Vivid obtained by TMZ, in which they say the name Iggy is gold protected by U.S. trademark. So maybe Vivid could market the tape this way, steaming sex tape featuring Shmiggy, Shmelia, and Hefe Wan. Vivid is unimpressed, restating its desire to market the tape. Sources close to Iggy says she feels betrayed by her ex-boyfriend. Christy Mack says her recovery is going great, and she's only a few surgeries away from fixing the damage done to her face, allegedly by ex-boyfriend MMA fighter War Machine. Mack was outside an event for the Face Forward Foundation, an advocacy group who support victims of domestic abuse, when she gave us an update on a current on her current condition. As TMZ previously reported, War Machine pleaded not guilty to 32 charges, including two counts of attempted murder. Mack told police her ex came to her home August 8th, beat her friend, Corey Thompson, then pummeled her, breaking multiple bones all over her body and rupturing her liver. And finally tonight, No Good Deed topped the box office this weekend and helped reinvigorate a domestic movie business that was flickering at low ebbs of reported variety. The Sony Scream Gem Thriller took in $24.5 million from 2,175 theaters, easily beating expectations. Going into the weekend, analysts expected the home invasion thriller to hover around $20 million. Females made up the bulk of the audience, taking up 60% of the seats in theaters. The film's success is a feature in the caps of stars Idris Elba and um, Taraji P. Henson, both of whom actively hawked the film on so social media. Um, Rory Brewer, Sony's uh, Pictures president of Worldwide Distribution, said they're absolutely elevated. It. They're, they're so hardworking. It was a great collaboration. It also helps that No Good Deed uh, cost a mere $13 million to produce. Brewer said it's going to be a hugely successful for the studio. Although pitched at a different demographic, its success may have suppressed business for the weekend's other wide release, Dolphin Tale 2. Warner Brothers' Alcon Entertainment sequel puts up $16.5 million across 3,656 theaters. The picture cost a modest $36 million to produce making it a low-risk venture for its backers. However, box office um, prognosticators have expected the film to do $20 million of business. Dolphin Tale 2 could not match the $19.2 million debut of its 2011 predecessor. Um, that film went on to make $72.3 million domestically. Harry Connick Jr., Ashley Judd, Morgan Freeman, and Chris Christopherson returned with Charles Martin Smith back at the helm. Females made up 63% of the film's opening audience, with 44 of the initial audience clocking in at under the age of 25. And The Drop, a Fox searchlight thriller starring Tom Hardy and the late James Gandolfini, managed to muscle its way into sixth place despite debuting on a limited number of screens. Um, the Chirinan Entertainment uh, produced The Drop, which premiered at the Toronto Film Festival last weekend. The, ad the adaptation of the Dennis Lehane a short story racked up $4.2 million across 809 theaters. Analysts have pegged the film for a $2 million bow. Sliding in at third place, Guardians of the Galaxy becoming the first film this year to pass the $300 million uh, domestically. The Marvel film added another $8 million to its haul. Globally, it stands total of at $612 million with the debut in China still to come. That figures should continue to rise. In its six-week Paramount's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles secured fourth place, picking up $4.8 million and driving its total to $181 million statewide. In limited release, the disappearance of Eleanor Rigby debuted to just $77,181 in four locations. Weinstein Company reconfigured the Marshall uh, drama starring Jessica Chastain substantially. When it debuted on the festival circuit, it was two films, one depicting the disintegration uh, the disintegration of a relationship from a woman's perspective, the other from the man, but the studio is releasing a spliced together single version. The overall box office was improved over what uh, what shape up to be an anemic weekend after Labor Day, but it could not match the year ago period when the city as Chapter 2 bowed to north of $40 million. And as your entertainment report for Monday, 
September 15, 2014. I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back tomorrow delivering some of the major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash the entertainment report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O. Or on Twitter at the Enter Report. I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye, guys.